Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 11, and we call this a warning against Judaizers, and Paul's testimony is an illustration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now today, we're only going to be looking at verses this morning, 1 and 2, and perhaps a little bit of 3, and then uh, we're, we're only going to get to verses 1 to 4 today. So really today is going to be Paul's uh, definition of what is a true and false Christian as he looks at the Judaizers. And just a word of introduction, uh, Philippians <clears throat> is one of the prison epistles written from Rome anywhere from between about 61 to 63 AD. And it was a uh, likely scholars, the consensus is that, of scholars is that it was sent out with uh, three other epistles. Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, or Philemon. So we have the mature Apostle Paul writing almost 10 years after the book of Galatians, and we see that the Judaizers are still a problem that is plaguing the churches of Jesus Christ. But I'll read verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation or concision. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost to the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. As Paul comes to the concluding section of his epistle to the Philippians in Philippi is a Roman colony like Corinth he cautions the brethren against false teachers whom he describes as vile and wicked men. And he exhorts them to imitate his personal experience in moving from heresy, self-confidence and self-righteousness to a true biblical understanding of self that results in placing all of one's faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You have to have a proper understanding of self and just how wicked we really are and how we fall far short of what God requires before one can embrace Christ and his righteousness. <clears throat> the apostle presents his own theological pilgrimage <clears throat> from legalistic Pharisee to a true Christian in order to instruct them in the perfection of and all sufficiency of the redemptive work of Christ. And this is a very needed message in our day, as we see when we'll do some application. Roman Catholicism, which teaches that we are saved by faith plus works, that we are saved not by the imputed righteousness of Christ, but by an interior work of grace within us, that we must cooperate with this grace, and if we get good enough, if we have enough good works, if we have enough law keeping, if we submit to the ordinances of the church good enough, then we can become saints, then we can become justified. That is very similar to what the Judaizers were teaching. We have the Federal Vision Heresy today, which teaches that we need 
faith in Christ, plus we need our own subjective faithfulness. And if our faithfulness is good enough, on the day of judgment, God will declare us to be justified. And they deny that. They teach salvation by works, but they are teaching salvation by works because they are unwilling to make a distinction between faith alone in Christ, which justifies, and sanctification as a separate work of grace that is necessary in being a Christian, but it is not part of your justification. And that's the difference between Rome and Protestantism. His creed, Paul's creed, is nothing in myself I bring, only to thy cross I cling. This is the gospel. This is the message we all must know thoroughly, and we all must be able to teach it to others. In our day, this is rejected for Arminianism, largely by evangelicals, which is that you make yourself born again by exercising your autonomous free will and that you generate your own faith by your autonomous free will and thus faith, we're not saved through faith as an instrument which lays hold of Christ. We're saved because of faith, because of what we do, and thus men have reason to brag. I was wise enough and spiritual enough to choose Christ. You were not. And that is a great heresy. Paul is the perfect example of why all forms of legalism are deadly heresies. Because if anyone had claimed to some kind of personal achievement and righteousness, it would have been Saul of Tarsus. A Jew of Jew, a Pharisee of Pharisees. A legalist of the highest order. A religious fanatic who persecuted the church. Now before we examine this testimony that points us to Christ, we need to consider some introductory remarks relating to our text. And it's interesting that Paul's whole testimony really flows out of his last point when he defines what is a true Christian, the marks of a true Christian, which we're going to look at, Lord willing, this morning. <clears throat> First, the expression, finally, my brethren, indicates that Paul has the end of the present epistle in mind, in sight. He uses the idiom, finally, Greek, ta, loipon, in many other epistles. When he's drawing to a close, he says, finally. 1 Corinthians 7, Ephesians 6. In, in Ephesians, it's in the genitive. 1 Thessalonians 4 and uh, 2 Thessalonians 3. And again, in Philippians 4, 8. To indicate that the end of the letter is drawing near. And the great Greek scholar A.T. Robertson says this expression means literally, as for the rest. As for the rest. The expression, my brethren, is intended to indicate respect and affection for the Philippians, and it will sweeten the strong warning that is about to follow. <clears throat> Second, the apostle transitions to this new topic with an exhortation to rejoice in the Lord. We are to rejoice in the love, fellowship, and grace of Jesus Christ. We are to exalt in the Redeemer's loving dominion over our lives and his sovereign control over our destinies. Christ is all. We are nothing. The more we focus on Christ and what he has done in our behalf, the more we will stand up to trials and temptations. The more <coughs> willing we will be to stand up for his precious gospel and do and fight the good fight on his behalf. Your life, your whole focus, everything must be focused upon Christ and what he has done for you. If you look at self, you sink like Peter in the Sea of Galilee. When he looked at himself, he sank. When he looked at Christ, he walked on the water. We have to be focused on Christ or we will go into despair and we will backslide and we will fail. Life can bring many trials, tribulations, and disappointments. If our joy is in Christ instead of subjectively or on worldly considerations, we will never be tempted to fall away for our walk. Uh, our walk is with Him. Our focus is on Him. 
not on self, not on what we have, not on personal pleasure, not on worldly enjoyments, not on keeping up with our neighbors. Those things are all not important. Your focus on Christ is important. As we read in Nehemiah 3.10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The Christian religion is not some morose system which stifles every spring of cheerfulness in the heart. And there are some churches I visited and you go there and they're all sourpusses and they all think that we have to walk around depressed and beat ourselves up all the time, how unholy we are. That is not biblical Christianity, it's a religion of joy. Yes, we mourn over our sins, yes, we hate our sins, but it's a religion of joy because we have victory in Christ. Jesus came to set us free and give us the abundant life of spiritual blessedness by his blood and sinless life. He lifts us out of the thrall and misery of sin and elevates us to the enjoyment of the divine favor and the possession of life eternal in God's presence. He takes us from the gutter. He takes us from the sewer of our sin and misery, and he lifts us up. He brings us into the family of God. He justifies us. He presents us to the Father. And we enjoy our salvation. Is that your focus in life? If that's your focus in life, you will have joy in Christ. No matter what happens. Because life contains many pains, many disappointments. Don't think about the disappointments. Focus on Christ and serve Him. Yes, these bad things have happened. Yes, they're painful. But look what Christ has done for me. Christ, I'm going to serve you till the day I die, no matter what happens. Such a sentiment will fortify the Philippian believers against the enslaving delusions of the Judaizers, who were not looking to Christ, they were looking to self. In the second half of verse 1, we learn that Paul had warned them before of the dangers of the Judaizers. Now remember the Judaizers. You read about them in Galatians. You read about them in Acts, the book of Acts. They plagued the church from the beginning. It was a group of Jews who professed faith in Jesus Christ, but believed you had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, the whole thing, in order to be saved. In other words, Christ isn't enough. Faith alone is not enough to lay hold of Christ and his benefits. One must submit to all the rules and regulations in order to be saved. And Paul condemned that from beginning to end. When the gospel is at stake, Paul likes to repeat himself for the protection of the flock. It is good for us to hear the same truths, to revive the remembrance and strengthen the impression of things of importance That's why we say, well, I've heard the gospel before. Well, we need to hear it again. We need to refocus on it. We need to refocus on Christ repeatedly. The fundamentals of the faith should be repeatedly preached upon and studied by Christians so that our minds are saturated by these crucial truths. You should know this stuff so well. You should have it down so uh, solidly that it's second nature to you, that you automatically think the right things. You automatically have the right doctrines. I'll never forget when I was trying to plant a church in Lansing, Michigan many, many years ago, and I went door to door. I went door to door a lot, and I was using that method where you would ask people, well, you've died, you're standing before God in the day of judgment. What are you going to tell God? What are you going to say to God to where he's going to let you into heaven? What is the reason? What is the foundation of how you should go to heaven? or why you should go to heaven. And I talked to many, many evangelicals, Roman Catholics and atheists and unbelievers. No one gave me the right answer. Not one evangelical, and I met many evangelicals, knew the right answer to the question of how are we justified before God. The best answer I got was, well, we accept Jesus as our personal savior and we let him into our heart. That's not the gospel. That sounds good. But the gospel is not letting Jesus into the heart. The gospel is trusting in Christ and his redemptive work. And then we're declared righteous in the heavenly court by God the Father. You need to know this. And you need to know this down pat. 
when this is done, Christians immediately recognize false doctrines and repudiate false teachers. Joel Olstein should not be the most popular preacher in America. He should be a greeter at Walmart. This point is rather obvious, yet many professing Christians in our day have a woeful ignorance of crucial doctrines such as the atonement, the new birth, justification by faith alone, and sola scriptura. It is in this atmosphere that false teachers and charlatans flourish. And I'll never forget, I saw R.C. Sproul Jr. speak many years ago. I think it was R.C. Sproul Jr. And he was at a big book conference, one of these giant evangelical book conferences. And he had a table and he's selling, I'm sure he's selling his books, probably his father's books mainly. <clears throat> and him and somebody went around and these are all evangelicals. This is not a secular book conference. And they're going around and they're t asking people uh, things like, do you know the Lord's Prayer? Do you know the Ten Commandments? What is justification by faith alone? People didn't know. They didn't know, the, they didn't know the Ten Commandments. They didn't know the Lord's Prayer. They didn't know what is justification by faith. They didn't know. If Christians don't know, professing Christians, professing evangelicals, who say they're born again, that our nation is doomed. For judgment begins with the household of God. The church must get its act together and get its doctrine straight before it can tell the state what to do and rebuke the state and have a prophetic role. And when the church can't get salvation right, and of course they don't have worship right, and they don't have their politics right, then we can expect sodomite marriage. We can expect persecution to come. Well, let's look now at Paul's warning against false teachers. <clears throat> the immediate context that leads to the apostle's beautiful presentation of the gospel from his own life is a strong warning against false teachers. Verse 2, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision or the mutilation. In the Hebrew style of emphasis, Paul sets forth a threefold reiter reiteration against the Judaizers. It's very common in Hebrew. We find this throughout the scriptures. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Praise the Lord with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Three times the verb watch out for, blepete, occurs with different objects that emphasize the various nefarious aspects of these false prophets. When the apostle describes the enemies of the gospel, he is not afraid to use strong and even offensive and shocking speech. This is strong language, and this is not young Apostle Paul, this is old Apostle Paul in the, in the 60s in Rome. And these words form a strong parallel to Strong's earlier denunciation of the Judaizing teachers in Galatians and 2 Corinthians. In the first terse statement, they are called dogs. <coughs> now, you, uh, you have to understand how offensive this was to Jews and to people in the East. They had a hatred for dogs, and to the Jews they were vile, unclean creatures. Proverbs 26, 11, 2 Peter 2, 22, etc. There's many passages. The Jews referred to the Gentiles as dogs because they were regarded as unclean enemies of the true religion. To the Jew, it was the N-word. It was a deliberate insult, a very strong insult. There are certain characteristics of dogs that fit the Judaizers like a glove. Number one, <coughs> like packs of wild, ravenous dogs, the Judaizers would follow the apostle from city to city, 
devouring those who are weak or ignorant with their doctrine. Now, if you've ever, uh, we don't have a lot of wild dogs roaming America. So the best analogy for us would be a pack of wolves. Now, if you've ever watched nature shows about wolves, how they operate, they don't go after the strongest deer or the strongest buck or the strongest elk. They follow the flock and they go after the straggler, the weakling, the young, the sick. The dogs in the Middle East were wild and masterless animals. Remember, to the Jew, they weren't allowed to have dogs. They didn't have pet dogs like we do. They were unclean animals. They despised them. They were wild and masterless animals, prowling in the evening, feeding on garbage and devouring unburied corpses. As savage generally as they were greedy. Today, the cults that deny the divinity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, and salvation by grace through faith alone, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, wander the streets and feast on professing Christians who are ignorant of fundamental doctrines. They appear with suits and ties and broad smiles, but they are shameless, wicked, malevolent savages who prey on men's souls. Now, back in the 1970s, and I was, I was a door-to-door -door salesman, I used to run into Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses all the time. And I actually had a Jehovah's Witness big shot. He was one of the big guys because they usually take a mature heretic with them who can handle the Christian art. He said, look, we don't want fundamentalists. We don't want Christians who really are strong believers in the Bible. We want people... You know, I'm paraphrasing, they, they want liberals. They want people who don't know the Bible. They want people who don't know doctrine that they can mold and fit into their image of a heretic. If a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon comes to your door and you know the Bible and you know doctrine and they see that, they turn and run. Dogs prey on the weak. Dogs prey on the ignorant. Dogs prey on the sick. And number two, the Judaizers were like dogs in that they professed Christ but returned to apostate Judaism. As a dog returns to its own vomit. What was offensive to the Jews? That you could be saved solely by Christ without any good works. Because the Jews had perverted the Old Testament religion into a religion of salvation through law keeping. You obey the law of Moses, and if you're good enough, you go to heaven. That's what they taught. And Jesus battles that in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus points out, look, if you really understood how intense the law is, how deep it is, how it requires perfection even in your thoughts, perfection in your mind, in your heart, they would never think such a thing. But the Jews externalized everything. Oh, I've never committed adultery. Jesus says, yeah, but you've lusted. You're guilty. They were not content with the simplicity of the gospel and the sufficiency of Christ's death and thus embraced the satanic lie of legalism. Legalism. The religion of humanism. The religion of man. It's universal. Islam. Judaism. The cults. Roman Catholicism. All teach Legalism, salvation by faith plus works. And then number three. They were like dogs in that they snarled and barked against apostolic doctrine. They wanted to tear the true preachers of the gospel apart with devouring words of reproach and scandal. Everywhere Paul went, these dogs were barking and attacking him, and gossiping, and lying about him, and accusing him of this, and accusing him of that. During the Counter-Reformation, the Papal Church sent dogs throughout Europe to attack, to attempt to tear the Protestant Reformation in pieces. 
today. There are many dogs who attack the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholic apologists, Arminian preachers, the Federal Vision advocates. They're dogs. They're vicious. They're wolves who prey in the souls of men. Modern churchmen must be willing to identify such men as devouring dogs and warn the flock. These are dogs. They come as angels of light. They put on an act. They sound nice. They tell wonderful stories. They have great jokes. They wear white shoes. They have their hair combed perfectly. But they're dogs. If they do not warn people, then they are not like Paul, and they are not protecting the sheep. For example, read how people like George Gillespie and John Owen describe Arminians. Read what they say about Arminians. And then read what modern so-called Reformed preachers today say about Arminians. John Owen, they're heretics. Do not extend the right hand of fellowship to these wicked heretics. Modern preachers, oh, they're a little mixed up. They're our wonderful brothers in Christ. You gotta call a dog a dog if you wanna protect the sheep. You gotta call a dog a dog if you wanna protect the sheep. If you're not willing to do that, get out of the pulpit. The second descriptive identification is evil workers. As vicious dogs, they act according to their nature. The Judaizers were men who prided themselves on their good works and their ability to keep God's law. They regarded themselves as exceptionally righteous, blameless, and exemplary. But in speaking against the true gospel, and by placing a stumbling block before new, young, vulnerable converts, vulnerable professing Christians, they reveal that their hearts are dark, wicked, and vile. They're wicked men. Their works are wicked. The pride of self-righteousness caused them to live as enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as enemies of the Son of God and His kingdom. Is there anything more evil than subverting the gospel and living to overthrow the truth and murder men's souls. I would rather be a drug dealer on the day of judgment than a false teacher, than a heretic who is spreading lies and subverting whole families and households and splitting churches with heresy. When the church is in desperate need of gospel workers, <clears throat> or workers of light and righteousness, these wicked laborers or toilers from the devil come in to draw attention away from Christ and his perfect, accomplished, sufficient redemption. They want us to fix our attention on abrogated rituals and our own supposed righteousness and attainments. How wicked. Anything that draws you away from Christ is evil. They are Satan's mongrel, barking, vicious, truth destroyers. They're dogs. Their minds are set on evil. And thus they are restless agitators for a damnable heresy. They have conferences and they invite their heretical friends to come. Like the Auburn Avenue conference. You need to look at them as what they are, evil workers, vile, filthy dogs who attack the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must beware of men who handle the word of God craftily, unfaithfully, and deceitfully. When the Auburn Avenue Doctrine, the Federal Vision came along, 2002, when you have a doctrine where theologians 
and pastors and seminary professors look at it and listen to the lectures, listen to the sermons, and they can't quite figure out what's going on. They can't figure out what's being taught. On the one hand, they act like they're talking about grace and Christ alone, and then on the other hand, they're talking about works necessary for salvation. Deceitful labor, deceitful workers, evil workers. They twist the Bible <coughs> to fit into their own preconceived notions with smooth equivocations and mind-bending perversions, they endeavor to subvert the gospel of Jesus Christ without appearing to be destroying the truth. That's why Paul says they come as angels of light. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. We need to listen carefully to Paul and, his, and heed his words for we live in a day when many professing Christians are not only ignorant of the fundamentals of the Christian faith but are even hostile to the teaching of doctrine and the condemning of false teachers if you preach doctrinal sermons and there's nothing unusual about that. If you look at the Puritans, that's the way they preached. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have application. Yes, you need to have application. But if you preach doctrinal sermons right out of the Bible, people say things like, well, he cares about doctrine. He doesn't care about people. That's what they used to say. Many Reformed preachers today are unwilling to condemn Arminianism as a damnable heresy. And they have no problem whatsoever with the federal vision heresy. Evangelical preachers and leaders, prominent leaders. Pat Robertson, for example. He praises on the Pope. Who is that antichrist. He's a wicked antichrist. And one of the greatest or most wicked false prophets on the whole earth. Every aspect of their doctrine is satanic to the core. What they're doing is satanic to the core. Yet they're praised by evangelical leaders. And Roman Catholicism is considered the true Christian religion by evangelical study, by most evangelicals. That wasn't that way in the 1940s when they were soundly condemned as totally wicked. Not anymore. Doctrine is not seen as important. Fighting heresy is not seen as important in today's church. It's seen as unloving. Oh, how you're building bridges, not you're building uh, walls, not bridges. Doctrinal preaching is said to be impractical and a waste of time. We are told that doctrine divides, but love unites as if biblical love could be separated from the truth, as if biblical love could be separated from the law of God, as if biblical love could be separated from doctrine. What a, a stupid, idiotic statement. Yet we hear it all the time. In addition, those who condemn false doctrine and false teachers are themselves condemned as unloving, uncharitable, divisive, and destructive of the peace and unity of the church. Machen, the founder of the OPC. If you go back and you read the stuff about him, he was accused of being unloving and a jerk. Who's destroying the peace of the church. He's the bad guy. And he was viewed by, as the bad guy, not simply by the modernists, by the liberals who hated the gospel, who hated Jesus Christ, who hated the resurrection, who hated the atonement. He was hated and disrespected and treated like dirt by the broad evangelical party within the PCUSA because they were mush. They were undoctrinal and didn't care about the Westminster Standards. The modern church to a large extent has abandoned the inspired teaching of Paul for a vague secular humanistic doctrine of love and pluralism, doctrinal pluralism. 
Let's just all love each other. Let's just all agree to disagree. I'm not talking about minor issues. I'm talking about major doctrines. The atonement, justification by faith alone, six-day creationism, the resurrection, etc., etc. Let's just all agree to disagree and love each other, and let's put doctrine on the back burner so we can have love and unity. Wrong! Yeah. The result is a downward spiral from one error and one compromise to another. The church is sinking into the abyss of heresy and falsehoods. We must be willing to look at heresy and false teachers through the lens of Scripture instead of through pop psychologists and compromisers. It's just secular humanism masquerading as Christianity. That's all it is. Joel Olstein has more in common with Oprah Winfrey than with the Apostle Paul. He really does. The third term is one of holy mockery. Paul says, beware of the concision, or literally, the mutilation. Tain catatomain. The apostle deliberately parodies the Judaizers' insistence on circumcision by calling them those who mutilate themselves. Those who cut themselves up. Now the Judaizers considered circumcision as the first requirement for keeping the whole Mosaic law and insisted that such law keeping had to be added onto the work of Christ in order for a Christian to be saved. That's a, that's a bad heresy. The Apostle's mockery here is intended to point out that since this Old Testament rite had been abrogated by the death of Christ and thus no longer had any value for believers, the Judaizers were simply cutting themselves. They were simply mutilating themselves unnecessarily. They were doing it for no good reason at all. They had no biblical reason to do it. He castigates the Judaizers with their emphasis on the outward rite of circumcision because A, it was now the outward sign of a deadly system of legalism. Okay, the Old Testament didn't teach that if you weren't circumcised, you were going to hell. You had to be circumcised, but if circumstances arose where you didn't have the opportunity, the Old Testament didn't teach sacramentalism. The New Testament doesn't teach sacramentalism. Paul doesn't teach sacramentalism, but the legalists did. And B, it was done as a mere ritual apart from the true inner circumcision of the heart or regeneration. The Judaizers would have been highly offended by this language. The cognate verb, by the way, is used in the Greek Septuagint of the mutilations that were forbidden by the law as in Leviticus 21.5, and it is employed in 1 Kings 18.28 of the self-inflicted mutilations of the prophets of Baal. I want you to see how shocking and offensive Paul's language would have been to the Judaizers. The Judaizers' carnal, unspiritual view of circumcision, the right in which they gloried, and in which they were eager to voice on all Christian converts, turned it into a mere incision, a mere laceration, with no more spiritual meaning or value than the wounds of the prophets of Baal. You're nothing but mutilators. You're nothing but cutters. It is quite clear from the language used that Paul did not consider the Judaizers to be Christians at all. And by the way, this is all what I'm preaching is absolutely 100% contrary to this new perspective on Paul, heretical crap that came out of England that's popular in America, that, oh, yeah, they weren't really true legalists. They just wanted a few identity markers of the Jews. Uh, they were true Christians. They just had a few problems. That's nonsense. 
These people were heretics. If, you, if they were true Christians that had a few minor problems, Paul wouldn't have called them dogs and the mutilation and wicked workers. The severity of the apostles' language contrasts sharply with his joy and friendship with reference to the Philippians. But was justified by the fact that a spiritual field so fair and hopeful was threatened and endangered by such disturbers. Paul's guarding the flock. Paul's doing his job as an apostle. He's doing the job that every minister of the gospel, every elder has a job to do. Protect the flock from false doctrine, especially damnable heresies. They're not doing it in the OPC. They're not doing it in the PCA. They put out a few pretty good papers that said, yeah, it's bad, it's wrong, but they don't discipline anyone who does teaches it. Such language which we find in Paul and among the reformers, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin, is frowned upon by churchmen today as unnecessarily harsh and uncouth. Yeah, they talked different back in the days of Luther and Calvin. We shouldn't talk that way. Well, Paul talked that way. Since the apostle was writing under divine inspiration, we can only view such speech as good and totally appropriate. This is not Paul's personal opinion as a man. This is Paul the Apostle writing by the divine inspiration, by the Holy Spirit. This is how we must view false teachers who deny the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ and who pray on new, vulnerable, professing Christians. This is how you should view the Federal Vision heretics and stop talking about them as our wonderful brothers in Christ. Nonsense! They're dogs! They're mutilators. They're evil workers. They're spreading heresy. When Doug Wilson says, oh, well, I really believe in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. I really believe in the true biblical reform doctrine of justification by faith alone. Well, Doug, that's great and good. If that's true, why are you speaking at conferences with men who explicitly deny such teaching? Such as Peter Lightheart, who you hired and you pay his salary. Or Steve Slissel, who says Luther's a fool. If I say I'm a friend of the Jews and I speak at conferences with Nazis, then you'd have to say, well, there's some inconsistency there, isn't there? If I write books with Nazis, I publish articles in Nazi books, I speak at all the Nazi conferences, well, maybe I'm a Nazi. Let's get things straight. The federal vision is a heresy. Don't be fooled by their equivocations and their deceptions. And then, we come to verse 3, <clears throat> where Paul's going to discuss what true Christians are. In verse 3, Paul identified, Paul justifies his strong condemnation of the Judaizers by contrasting them with genuine believers who he identifies as the true circumcision. For we, this is, um, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So here are three marks of what it means to be a true Christian. We're going to look at that. Christians are the true circumcision or the true Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. Do you want to know if you're a true Jew? Do you believe in Jesus Christ and Him alone by faith? Are you putting all your trust in Him? Do you regard all your works as filthy rags before God that are worthless in God's sight and put all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and His death and resurrection? Then you're a true Jew. Then you're the true circumcision. For the Judaizers only circumcised outwardly in the flesh. While the true circumcision that really matters is that of the heart. As Paul says in Romans 2, 28 to 29, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly in the flesh, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. 
whose praise is not from men, but from God. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You are the true circumcision. You are the true Israel of God. You are the holy nation, the church international that replaced ethnic Israel or national Israel as the true people of God when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. What Paul is teaching here would be seen as radical and shocking to the first century Jew, the typical first century Jew. He is saying that the church of Jesus Christ, composed of both Jews and Gentiles, are the truly circumcised covenant people of God. Both Jews and Gentiles are sinners who cannot be saved by keeping the law of Moses. As Paul says in Romans 3, 22 to 23, after he has a lengthy section dealing with the sins of the Jews, the sins of the Gentiles, they both fail. They both fall short. For there is no difference for all both Jews and Gentiles, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, what is really crucial is the new birth, regeneration, or the circumcision of the heart, and faith in Christ. The Old Testament ritual of circumcision only symbolized the radical change of the heart affected by the Holy Spirit due to a person's union with a divine human mediator in his death and resurrection. In Colossians 2, 11 to 14, circumcision, uh, which is the old covenant sign of regeneration and union with Christ, and baptism, which is the new covenant sign of regeneration and union with Christ, are brought together. Listen to this. Colossians 2, 11 to 14, we read this. For in him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of sins, of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism in which you were also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your heart flesh he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You can't get any clearer than that. By his sacrificial death, Jesus has broken down the middle wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles. Ephesians 2.14. And therefore, everyone who believes in Christ has Abraham as his spiritual father, Galatians 3, 9 and 29. Our father is Abraham. And our father is Abraham more than an unbelieving Orthodox Jew living in Jerusalem who hates Jesus Christ is, has Abraham as his father. No, the devil, Jesus said, is his father. And he hates what Moses said because Moses taught of Jesus Christ. Believing Gentiles are full citizens within the household of God, Ephesians 2.19. Therefore, the Apostle Peter applies the language of Exodus 19.6, where God formally declares Israel as a nation to the multinational New Covenant Church. Listen to this, 1 Peter 2.9 and 10. But you, and the context makes it crystal clear, he's writing to Jews and Gentiles in the Christian church, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. You are the Israel of God. You are the true circumcision who believe in Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're Eskimo or Swahili or Dutch or German or from Brazil. You are the true Israel of God if you believe in Jesus Christ. All of this makes perfect sense when we understand that a covenant relationship with God can only be established through the sacrificial blood of Christ. In the Old Testament, when God established the covenant with Israel, what do they do? They sacrificed bulls. They sprinkled the blood on the people. That symbolized what Christ does. 
It is only through Jesus Christ's blood that the covenant is established between us and God. And when you believe in Christ, you enter into that covenant with God, that saving relationship. You are reconciled to God. Your sins have been propitiated. The wrath of God has been propitiated. Your sins have been expiated. You are redeemed in Christ. Look to him. Believe in him. Not in sacramentalism. Not in works. Yes, when you're a Christian, you do good works out of gratitude for your salvation that Christ has given you. But you don't do good works to be saved. That's heresy. Now we're going to take a little break. We've got a few more things to say about this verse. And then we're going to, we're going to look at the, what, what, are, what are the marks of a true Christian? Paul gives three marks of a true Christian. Three marks. And then that's going to spring forth into Paul's wonderful description of himself as an example. Someone who accepted pharisaical legalism and then rejected it and became a Christian. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that you have instructed us so effectively through your servant, Paul, who you inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of God that are infallible, that are perfect for us, because we need to hear this, Lord. Ingrain these truths into our mind that we would not abandon them ever and cause us to be focused on Christ so that when bad things happen, persecution or calamity happens, we're ready. And we don't think about ourselves. We think about Christ. We focus on him. Our joy is in him, Lord. Give us that joy. Cause us by the Holy Spirit to appreciate what he has done. Cause us by the Holy Spirit to appreciate his person and his work. In Jesus' name.